Great, thanks, Emily. And thank you so much, Chayla. That was fantastic. Um, so now I'll share a second pilot project, um, which is pretty large. <laughs> this is the largest derelict wharf removal that's occurred in San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is the Terminal 4 Wharf in the city of Richmond. Really wanna call out the city of Richmond for being a great early partner in this work and embarking on voluntary derelict structure removal uh, with the Coastal Conservancy and many other partners. The city of Richmond is the lead, but I'm happy to share some of the key aspects of this project um, and some of the lessons learned. Next slide, Emily. So there are many pilot projects that the Coastal Conservancy has really been helping to lead and or support. I think I just wanna call out that I've been so proud that our state agency has been willing to be a guinea pig, been willing to engage in this at an early stage of science and provide resources, um, connect different types of teams, connect municipalities. And so this is just a, a sample of the types of pilot projects that have occurred that all have monitoring reports and data that we'd be happy to share after the call. And I'll focus in a bit on the terminal for wharf removal. Next slide. I really wanna kind of call out that shoreline cleanup is a key step in sea level rise adaptation. Uh, we have so many derelict uh, structures on our shorelines, including old creosote wharves and pilings. And so while we may think of this as not the newest exciting topic, this is a critical topic so that we can do this cleanup, assess contaminants and fill, and how to consider and, and manage that fill when thinking about a follow-up living shoreline. Um, we can see the types of impacts here, shading, just straight fill that takes the place of where habitat can flourish, and other impacts to hydrology and natural processes. These are of the Red Rocks Warehouse in City of Richmond and also Terminal 4 on the bottom right. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of work, um, including from Merkel and Associates, SFEI, many others through the subtitle Habitat Goals effort, the 50-year conservation plan. There was an effort to map all 33,000 derelict pilings that could be seen at low tide in San Francisco Bay. That was done by NOAA out in boat surveys and a desktop exercise by SFEI. There are four hot spots. San Francisco, the mouth of the Napa River, Richmond, and then also the Carquinez Straits, which many folks know if you've taken the train to Sacramento, you can really see. So that middle map shows where pilings are most predominant. And that left map shows where they overlie or align also with historic herring spawning habitat that Chela was talking about, as well as eelgrass habitat and potential eelgrass habitat that Keith Merkel and Audubon and SFSU and others have been thinking about. And so when you map this against areas like City of Richmond, um, we did come up with, there's been a large regional priority to focus on some piling structures at Point San Pablo in Richmond, which is close to the largest eelgrass bed in the Bay. That, that bottom right map shows that big eelgrass bed just north of the point at the top middle of the picture. That eelgrass bed is highly unique. It's about a quarter of all the eelgrass in the Bay. Um, the eelgrass fluctuates three to 4,000 net acres bay wide and about a 1,500 acres is in that bed. So a great place to provide propagules and protect as we think about these projects. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of Point San Pablo. Um, this is a very active industrial site and marine, several marine terminals were constructed in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, there are two stars on the map. We can see on the top, um, the top star is the Red Rocks former warehouse. You can see the warehouses along the shoreline there and the pilings and structures in the water. So that was a pilot project I'll chat about briefly. That was, uh, that, that those structures were removed in 2016 and a living shoreline put in in 2018. And then terminal four is that big structure, the, the bottom, thanks so much, Emily, much larger, a um, thousand foot long wharf, 2,500 pilings, a 12,000 square foot warehouse. And so it was key to do the smaller pilot project first, gather some lessons learned about methods, equipment, techniques before embarking on the large project. 
And so you can see also some interesting, the, the uh, Red Rock site is right next to the oldest whale or the, the last whaling station closed in the United States in 1972. A lot of fascinating history here. And a lot of railroad and wharf and shipping that is historically occurring out here. Next slide. Um, but this shows one of the great, you know, historic maps. So this is a natural headland at Point San Pablo with rocky intertidal peninsulas that existed historically. And so you can see that in sort of the blue areas with those rocky intertidal headlands. And they have been filled for development, for the railroad, for wharves and piers. And so you can see Terminal 4 in the background there on the left. And you can see the fill area just inland where all of that has been filled historically. So a challenging site to work in when thinking about cut and fill of the wharf itself now. Next slide, please. So the Red Rock site, you know, I just wanted to show this one slide. On the right, we see some of the nice graphics from the Subtitle Habitat Goals document. Um, there are box and arrow conceptual diagrams that describe things, but there are also really helpful, just layperson friendly graphics that help to describe things. So pilings can provide some short term benefits, you know, species can settle and land on them, but because it's coal PAH tar, it's toxic for many species. So it is not a healthy environment, um, but they can influence sedimentation, wave energy, habitat, shading bottom habitats. And so for this first structure, um, it was removed in 2016. Um, there was a pilot project after that removal to enhance multiple habitat types. So eelgrass plantings, we can see in the map on the bottom right, there are eelgrass plantings throughout the green area. There are several crescent shaped sets of reefs. There are 200 oyster reef elements that were placed at the site, three different types, shellbag mounds, reef balls, and oyster block elements. And then those yellow areas were where um, concrete was actually broken up into smaller sections. We can kind of see a picture to the left of that for the purposes of spreading existing fucus, specific rockweed that was colonizing on that concrete and providing more surface area for it to spread. This was a really successful activity. Merkel's been monitoring this site for over five years and there's about 300,000 oysters estimated at the site, a variety of species using the reefs and substantial expansion of rockweed. Next slide, please. So for the Terminal 4 removal project, we wanted to take all of these lessons learned. It is the largest derelict structure. So removing it is to remove about 9% of the creosote pilings in the bay, and that's been done. So that's very exciting. Removing a marine debris source and contaminated fill. This is a huge recommendation in the subtitle goals report to address this issue. Creosote was used extensively through the 90s. It's now been prohibited by CDFW and other agencies and concrete pilings are preferred. Although I would say living pilings maybe should be a topic that we look at increasing the rugosity and complexity of that concrete. Um, but this really came about the focus on this because Pacific herring spawn on the creosote structures. Gary Schur and Bodega Marine Lab have done 20 years of studies showing toxicity effects and impacts to fish and other species through the food chain. And so the goal was really to remove this structure and then passively you know, restore eelgrass habitat and rocky intertidal habitat just through the removal of the fill that was in the way of where those habitats could exist and also shading and you know, impacting the quality of those habitats. And then I'll talk briefly about a test pilot project there's an area where shoreline protection needed to be replaced. And so there's an enhanced rock slope as part of the design. Next slide, please. This is a picture of that structure at Point San Pablo, Terminal 4, it gives you a sense of the scale of this project. Also a sense of how complex it is to think about the terrestrial approach versus the aquatic approach for uh, equipment access, and work. And so it's been a combination of those two things. For the most part, this site was deep enough to bring in large scale barge and crane marine equipment to do the bulk of the demolition. But that's because, you know, it ranges from like, you know, zero tide down to 60 feet deep 
at the edge of that wharf, especially at the north. So that was great for access and not everybody has that. Sometimes we're in very shallow conditions, which then require really careful consideration of access for equipment. Um, next slide, please. And then this is the southern end of that wharf and there's a very large existing eelgrass bed that you can see just inshore. And that's something that's the purpose of this project to protect that eelgrass bed and help it to expand. You can see that the old pilings, you know, the eelgrass is in and amongst all those old pilings and starting to recruit into that area. But through removal of all of that fill, we can give that eelgrass bed a better chance. Um, but the complexity of this is that the actual demolition can cause short term impacts. And so the project is monitoring eelgrass pre and post um, according to the California eelgrass mitigation policy. And if there's any net loss, then there will be additional planting of eelgrass. But our hope and, and the modeling that's been done is that it will be beneficial without having to do that. We'll see expansion. Next slide, please. So the key demolition tasks were to remove a thousand foot wharf and all the decking, 12,000 square foot warehouse, 1100 square foot dock master's office, 2400 piles and about 2700 tons of debris on the bay floor. We can obviously see much of the decking and piles have already sunk. And so that's been of critical consideration with how to uh, deal with that with the design and plans and contractor equipment. And then there's a section of 350 feet of shoreline right behind the warehouse where shoreline protection needed to be replaced. There is some failing sunken seawalls, old wooden and concrete structures, riprap that was under there. And so at first the standard rock slope was planned, standard Caltrans riprap slope. But there are three uh, biological elements that have been integrated into that, crown plantings um, in, at the top of that slope, seaweed cobbles embedded into the face of that slope, and oyster reef elements at the toe of that slope. Next slide, please. So the demolition occurred July through November of 23, and this is just a picture of that operation. Um, Silverado, Dutra, Manson, many companies have participated in this and worked alongside each other in a collaborative way to get the work done. And it was a 20, not 24 hour, but seven day a week operation for sure to make use of the seasonal window and to get the work done in a timely way. So we were thrilled that this occurred in less than six months, um, according to all permit conditions and with strong biological monitoring every minute of the day while they were out there working. Next slide, please. And then here is that section of the main deck that I'm referring to where 350 feet of shoreline needed to be protected with some replacement protection. It is highly energetic, this site. It's right at that you know, highly dynamic area between Point San Pablo and Point San Pedro in the bay. A lot of wave energy, a lot of wind energy, and also a very steep shoreline, as I mentioned. So this took a lot of planning to decide what would go in here. Next slide, please. And here's some pictures of sort of what it looks like under that. You know, we had an incredibly interesting mix of native rock, which is precious in the Bay. A lot of it has been removed or um, covered up with sediments from the gold rush, et cetera. And so to have native rock was a, a real beneficial thing. And there was an effort to salvage that native rock during the dem demolition, but it's mixed with a huge amount of metal pipes, other types of debris, concrete, you can see uh, creosote pilings that are wrapped in concrete collars here. So the wharf had been maintained and had maintenance over time to add those types of features, but it was a big mess of different anthropogenic debris as well as native resources that we wanted to protect. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of that enhanced rock slope protection design. Um, as I mentioned, there's sort of in the, in the you can see the standard Caltrans number two rock slope in the design in the top. Um, but the bottom right, you can see um, crown plantings planned for the crown of that slope. So um, filling those voids with soil and planting coastal marsh species, appropriate native species down that edge. And then embedding seaweed cobbles into the face, we can kind of see a reference to that in the top picture. 
Um, the fucus treatment that's just above that zone, Emily, and it's actually not well identified on this picture. And that's one of the lessons learned is to better put the natural plants and elements just as clearly as the traditional gray that the engineers are more used to putting on CAD plans and specs. And then the living toe is in that green area on the right. So the placement of nine uh, oyster reef balls and then a series of crescent rocks around those groupings so that we could look at um, the recruitment of native species on both the reef balls and quarry rocks and native rocks, as well as look at the wave energy and how they would respond to that. Next slide, please. So these are some pictures of the shoreline excavation. So this is after the debris removal. You can see in that top left, a big mix of different debris, um, concrete pads that needed to be removed, old riprap, wood, metal. So a complex situation for excavation and then placement of a backing layer of rock and then quarter ton rock. Um, but one of the issues that occurred is gravel was included in this design and the sequencing and placement of the quarter ton rock and gravel resulted in some issues. It's really important to have three points of contact between the large rock in order to make sure that that interlocks and does not move. Um, if we go to the next slide. This is uh, monitoring that started to occur because the project team started to notice erosion of this slope as soon as two days after construction. Uh, this is not a picture, it's actually a drone model of data, which fascinates me. It is, there is so much data included in this via one drone survey that's able to collect ortho rectified positions. So elevation, XYZ elevation and, and data that can allow us to compare the change of the slope versus the as-built construction. And this resulted in additional surveys, next slide, that occurred to track this issue. So there were traditional terrestrial survey points, there was orthorectified drone data, there were multi-beam surveys via a boat at high tide and also side scan surveys that did indicate, especially through second party engineer review, that the slope was in fact eroding because the gravel had been placed between the quarter ton rock. So this is a lesson learned that we would like to share broadly and make sure that others learn from this example. This slope is being rebuilt. That work's starting on October 21st and will finish by November 30th of this year. Um, but you can see that, you know, the placement of the reef balls, especially in the bottom left, you know, those were six feet from toe of slope. And you can see the change of this slope due to that one design issue. Um, so these are the type of lessons learned that we want to share broadly and make sure that um, this lesson can be learned once and not repeated again by others. Next slide, please. So I'm so sorry for all the words here, but some of our key insights and knowledge gain, obviously green gray integration is a new body of practice and it takes time to develop successful CAD plans and contractor implementation. And a lot of this is because it takes extra effort to develop and discuss clear sequencing of work terminology and especially to put strong information on the nature-based side of the methods onto these plans. And this does require extra time because in each of our different lenses, traditional engineers have a certain set of standards, terminology approach to this work that has not included things like seaweed cobbles and reef balls before. And so that takes time to then talk with ecologists about native habitats, ecosystems, adaptation, talk with marine contractors about their equipment, the conditions, the labor and the permitting that needs to be abided by when doing this. And for everyone to plan together for scenarios such as you know, not being able to perfectly survey under a dangerous hazardous wharf prior to demolition. And then I also just really wanna highlight how important it is as we innovate and as we add green to gray, don't forget to check the basics on the gray. So this was a standard Caltrans rock slope design, but the sequence of work, the size of material placement, the methods 
there were some um, lessons learned and challenges. And so it is important to make sure to not skip past the basics on the gray as we plan for green gray. And I really say those daily reports and weekly meetings between the project team are a key opportunity to make sure that integration is happening and continue to reaffirm and double check terminology and sequencing. And especially to raise awareness with contractors and standard construction managers about the increased uh, focus on voluntary ecological goals versus just minimum environmental protection and mitigation that might have been required of past gray projects. Um, and then, you know, these are dynamic projects in dynamic conditions. And so for this one, it was a daily discussion of adjusting the interplay between the terrestrial and marine equipment, and then um, being able to respond to new information each day about, oh, a new sunken piece of concrete in a seawall or a new piece of debris that we weren't aware of that we had to deal with. Um, next slide, please. So I, uh, we're developing many, I, I'll, I'll finish soon, Emily, I'm sorry for all the words here, but just suffice it to say, these projects are generating valuable info on many aspects. So the stages of design, how we develop design criteria, linking biological and physical goals, and then many other considerations with landowners who are new to this, regulatory agencies who are new to this, as well as marine contractors. So the more we can learn together and document these lessons learned and best practices, the better. And so next slide, that's, that's a key goal with our regional design and constructability guidance to make sure we capture these and share them broadly. And we welcome all of you to help contribute to this. We'll be focusing on this topic through the next collaborative meetings. Um, next slide. And so for that design guidance, I just want to give a brief teaser. I think Jeremy and others are really going to present on this in our next couple meetings. But this is to expand regional capacity. Our audience is focused on practitioners, city and county municipal staff, natural resource agencies. But this will be helpful for all sorts of folks, including those beyond who might actually own a project or implement a project. And the purpose is to provide better guidance for design and constructability for those 10 habitat approaches Jeremy showed, transfer the lessons learned, and then have consistent best design methods and construction practices as a regional entity, as a, as a region. And so we hope to complete this by summer of 25, but as we mentioned, data will be available earlier. I think we're at last slide and I really appreciate everyone hearing this uh, case study. Thank you so much and happy to take any questions. And again, wanna thank City of Richmond for their willingness to, to be a guinea pig here. And thank BCDC for requiring this in the permit with the Richmond Bridge way back when in the 90s. So a lot of partners. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Marilyn. I know for me, this is my first time hearing about the project and the work. So um, if it's, I, the chat is just lighting up with all sorts of questions and conversation, Marilyn. So um, just kudos to you for your your work on this and also your willingness to um, share with us the lessons learned. So hopefully we just learn them once as a group. Um, there will be other lessons we can um, pick up along the way. So there are a lot of can questions. Answer one question I'm seeing in the chat. So the yeah, disposal is a great yes. question. Um, the disposal is very careful, carefully managed to class two hazardous uh, facilities, landfills that can accept this type of, there's very clear tracking of that between the contractor, the construction manager, and even the receipts at the landfill to make sure that all material is disposed of correctly. And there was a lot of BMPs on site to make sure that they were handled correctly prior to transfer to the landfill. That's perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, maybe there's time for one question for Marilyn. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to grab one out of the chat. Um, one here is about how will the gray slope accommodate native species in migrating upslope with sea level rise? I don't know if that was a part of the kind of design consideration or if you... That is a great question. Yeah, we do. You know, this site is constrained. Um, it's pretty narrow fill adjacent inland to the project area, but on the slope itself, there is substantial room for oyster and subtitle species to 
expand upslope from the reef ball elements onto other rocky habitat. There's substantial room for the seaweed cobble um, transplants to then help seaweeds to further recruit upslope. And as sea levels rise, you know, it's, a, it's around a plus two mean low or low where we're placing um, seaweed cobbles. And with sea level rise, those could extend, you know, up to plus five, plus six, who knows? So that there's room for that to expand. And there's a planting basin at the back of the crown plantings that extends about eight feet inland. So there's a lot of room for uh, further spread of each of the three biological elements. And we'll be tracking that. Um, those elements will be put in after reconstruction this month.